Hello and welcome to everybody who's uh, joined us today for this uh, first, actually, uh, ODI webinar on uh, networks. Um, this is uh, a new way of doing meetings for us. Um, we're still experimenting, so please bear with us. Uh, technology does have a habit of uh, playing tricks on us, but uh, we will do our best to make sure we keep you all with us. Um, we are delighted to uh, have with us quite a, uh, a number of panelists and, and presenters who will be um, introduced to us a bit later on. Um, but first of all, I just want to check that uh, you can all hear me. So you should see a little uh, icon with a hand, which means you can raise your hand. So if you can hear me, just click that icon, give me a little sign, and uh, it'll tell me that we're all on. Good. Getting quite a lot of hands raised. About half of you have clicked. Excellent. Good, so we're broadcasting very loud and clear. Um, if there are any problems with the audio, um, we can't do anything about it at this end, but you, you do have a little audio setup button. Uh, so if you click that, you might be able to play around with some of the settings. Um, so for today, we have um, an agenda, which you should be seeing in front of you. Um, we're going to be having a presentation from uh, Ben Ramalingan, followed by another presentation by Enrique Mendizabal and myself. Um, then we'll be going into what we're calling a fish tank discussion with a couple of our discussants, Nancy White and Rick Davies. This will be facilitated by uh, Jeff Knezovich, who I'll be introducing in a shortly. And then we'll be going into a time of open discussion where we'll be bringing in your, uh, your questions, um, we'll be interacting with you as much as we can and we'll hopefully just see where the discussion goes. Then um, after about, we'll probably finish after about two hours with some final remarks and some uh, closing comments. Um, just to note, uh, the, there is a back channel for, for chat if you want to interact with some of the other participants. Um, unfortunately, the software we're using doesn't allow us to do that in, in, the, in the same room, but we've set up this other website. The link you should see in the top of your chat window, um, so do log in and, and use that as you will. There's also a tweet uh, hashtag, so if you, if you are a twi twi Twitterer, tweeter, then use that please and, uh, and then we can keep all the comments together. Um, I also just wanted to do a very quick poll. Um, now this is another feature of the software which I hope is going to work. Um, so if I just do this, I th think, yeah, you should see a poll in front of you now. Um, so we just wanted to find out what your experience is with networks. Um, so we've got four, uh, five options and just uh, click one that's best um, describes your experience. You know, are you a facilitator or part of a secretariat of a network? Um, do you fund networks? Do you evaluate networks? Uh, do, are you a researcher of networks? Or are you just a, a member of networks? Um, Nancy's just reminding me that there's not uh, an all of the above uh, option. Um, so we are forcing you to pick one, I'm afraid. This is just a, a rough um, you know, a, a rough poll if you like. Now, in a minute, we've got, had about 80% of you have voted, that's fantastic. In a minute I'll just close that and I think it should put up the results on the screen. So we'll just give you a couple more seconds to click one of those options. Okay, we got about 90%. So I'm going to close it and see what happens. Yep, I can share the results. So there you go. You'll see that about half of you are facilitators of networks or part of the secretariat. Uh, a quarter of you are just members of networks. And we've got some researchers and some evaluators, very few funders of networks out there. 
thanks. That's really useful to, to know a bit about you. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to hand over to our facilitator, Jeff Knezovic. And Jeff uh, is a former colleague. Um, he used to work here in the, in the RAPID team at ODI. Um, but now he works as the Policy Influence and Research Uptake Manager, a bit of a mouthful, um, of the um, Future Health Systems Research Program, which is hosted at the uh, Institute for Development Studies. Um, there's a lot of acronyms there, um, but uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar. Um, so, and, and I'm impressed that you're able to remember them all, Simon. Yep. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'll hand Are over. Are you ready to, to hand Jeff. over? Yeah, definitely. Well, as Simon said, I'm the Policy Influence and Research Uptake Manager for the Future Health Systems RPC here at IDS. And um, as such, it's, it's a bit of a network ourselves. So I'll be very interested to hear um, more thoughts on how we structure networks as a program or if programs even qualify as networks. And I expect that that's something that we'll get to hear a little bit more about. Um, but I do want to start by introducing Ben Ramalingam, who will be giving our first presentation. Uh, ben is currently a visiting research fellow here at the Institute of Development Studies, um, where he focuses on understanding complexity science and its role in development aid and humanitarian assistance. Uh, he maintains a blog on the topic at aidontheedge.info, in case you're curious. Um, before that, he was the head of research and development for the Active Learning Network for Accountability and Performance and Humanitarian Action, or ALMAP for short, um, where he led a team of researchers, policy analysts, communication specialists, and consultants in a range of innovative projects aimed to improve humanitarian performance through learning and accountability. So in addition to his work on complexity science, he's also a co-author of an ODI background note on applying the network's functions approach, and is the author of one of the papers for discussion this afternoon, Mind the Network Gaps. And with that in mind, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Ben for his presentation. Great. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Simon. It's a real pleasure uh, to be talking to this topic, which is close to my heart, and of growing interest in development and humanitarian work, and much more broadly, too. Um, it's especially good to be talking here with Enrique Mendizabal, who was a close collaborator in the development of the network functions approach a couple of years ago. And of course, Rick Davies and Nancy White, who have for some years shaped and mentored my own thinking on learning networks and communities. Um, my presentation today has got four parts. An introduction, where I'll talk briefly about the rise of networks. A summary of networks in practice in the development of humanitarian sectors, and an assessment of some of the emerging gaps. And then a review of what different theoretical developments can bring us. In conclusion, I'll try and draw all of this together and point us towards a shared way forward. Ben, can I interrupt you and ask you to go ahead and share your screen for us? Ah. I thought I had done it. How's that? There we go. Thank you very much. OK. So there's the four-part agenda, which I've just been uh, talking through. Um, so on to the introduction. This week, through only good intentions, Dr. Martin Luther King has been widely misquoted around the world. Uh, the widespread tweeting and Facebooking of his famous darkness devoid of stars quote shared an important sentiment, and it gave a voice to what many people around the world seem to feel this week. But it was also partly apocryphal. It was, there were sections of the quote that were being shared that were entirely made up. This illustrates, I think, some of the power and some of the weaknesses of networks. I thought, therefore, it was appropriate to start with a Martin Luther King quote that is accurate, at least one that I hope is, that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. What other effects one directly affects all indirectly? Networks, to borrow from Dr. King, are the vehicles for a new globalized sense of mutuality. They are popular as a concept, a metaphor, and a soundbite. And at the risk of being accused of sound bites myself, this is one area where the role of the internet cannot be overestimated. It is a profound symbol of and for our times. 
There are many who suggest that the idea of a network underpins a new paradigm for analysis and action, a new way of thinking about social interactions, about working life, about politics, crime and violence, the global economy, even life itself. Again, um, with, at the risk of being far too topical, I think gl the global war on terror, and in particular Al-Qaeda, and the shift that was needed in the international community to understand the nature of the globalist global terrorist threat exemplifies in some grim ways this new paradigm. And I think it will be especially interesting to observe how well this networked understanding of terrorism informs the decisions that, that face the international community now. This admittedly superficial comparison via Google returns does illustrate just how ubiquitous and pervasive the idea of the network has become. Googling network gives 1.8 billion hits, more than twice as many as machine, and almost six times as many as nation. My own view, and I think it's one that's shared by a lot of people, is that the idea of a network seems to be playing as important a role in the 21st century as machine did in the 19th and 20th. It's a fundamental concept and principle for how we think about our lives. So let me go on now to talk about networks in practice. Formal development and humanitarian networks have actually been around since before the rise of information and communication technologies. Global health networks, for example, date back at least till the 19, 1920s with the Health Secretariat of the League of Nations. There were numerous agricultural networks that were started in the 1960s and 70s that used postal systems and letters in order to share information and create a sense of a dispersed network for sharing knowledge and ideas. And there are many other examples as well. There are, what's different today is that there are frequent and increasing statements about networks from the highest levels of the system, from the former Secretary General of the United Nations, who described networks as key to new approaches in global governance. To the President of the World Bank, who last year called for multilateralism to be reframed as a league of networks. The trouble is that at an organizational and operational level, certain theories and perspectives in organizations and projects tend to dominate. Work which I led at ALNAP identified that the predominant way in which aid agencies talk about their own organization is the idea of a machine, which leads to technical recommendations, levers for change, and the idea of re-engineering organizations for maximum efficiency. And Rick Davies, one of our uh, commentators later on, has argued that projects are often cast in the log frame mentality and make few references to other perspectives and approaches. Even fewer make use of such approaches. The clear disparity between leadership rhetoric and on-the-ground reality led me in a slightly whimsical moment to coin the phrase aid netoric. Pronounced netoric, it's a form of rhetoric which applies to the exaggerated and bombastic use of the term network in the aid sector. The reality is, though, in my own time working with and helping to facilitate and advising networks, one of the key lessons is it's very hard to stop and think about what it is that makes what you are doing as a practitioner different. But many practitioners would concur that working in a network is often different. Some people seem to get it, and some people don't. Despite the vast and growing literature on networks outside the sector, and the relatively smaller literature within the sector, my own view is that tacit knowledge dominates both formal and informal networking practice. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it'd be good to talk about how we might be able to turn some of that tacit knowledge into frameworks, concepts, and models that can start to be more regularly shared. Again, drawing on the work of Rick Davies, network concepts are appropriate useful in a number of settings. Rick's provided us with a very useful typology. He talks about networks being useful in areas where there are many actors who are fairly autonomous and where there's no central authority. And they can be very useful in large projects with many stakeholders where a single authority is less likely, or in projects where there's no single objective but many alternative or competing objectives. 
And the fourth category is the one that many of us here are obviously part of, in projects that are deliberately designed to function as networks, what Rick refers to as named networks. As I said, there's a growing literature uh, on networks in the aid system, a preliminary review of which has identified some key gaps. There's, a, there's the question of what networks do and how they do it. And I think this is well covered, There's particularly by practitioners and increasingly in the literature itself. There's obviously the CPD model of Etienne Wenger, the network functions approach developed by ODI. Uh, there are nu numerous other approaches as well, and quite a lot of guides and handbooks on how to run networks more effectively. There are also issues or questions around the structure of networks and the implications for how functions, how network functions are fulfilled. I think this is rather less well covered. Rick Davies' work on social network analysis stands out, as does Ava Schiffer's NetMap tool for participatory network analysis. Another key question that we often ask ourselves are the dynamics of networks, the kinds of principles and ideas that can help us understand how networks start up, how they develop, and how they evolve. My own view is that in this particular area, the evidence that we have, or the information that we have, is largely impressionistic and anecdotal. The same, too, could be said of the socio-political and cultural aspects of networks. Again, mostly anecdotal, to do with uh, I guess in some ways origin myths of networks, where they came from, or stories about the key people that were behind networks. And then finally there are questions around the value of networks, the tangible and intangible value that are delivered by networks to their members. And there is some interesting work from outside of the sector on this, um, but again most of, most of the work within the sector is largely impressionistic. There have been a few interesting evaluations, but formal assessments of the value of networks have been thin on the ground. Okay, I'm going to go on now to talk about the lessons from different theoretical approaches and how they might help uh, tell us something about the gaps that I've just identified. So the four particular approaches that I want to talk about, um, social network analysis, complex adaptive systems, actor network theory, and value network analysis. Now these bodies of work vary considerably in their size and scope, but they all share one thing. They're relatively limited applications in development and humanitarian work. I'm going to go through them very quickly just to talk about the kinds of things that they offer to us. In the, in the think piece which uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, Jeff and Simon mentioned earlier, there's a little bit more of an assessment of the value and the costs of these different approaches and some of the challenges that we might face in applying them. So social network analysis, first of all. Um, perhaps the most famous tool for understanding networks, and they can really help us develop a richer picture of network structures and help identify the different structures that are at play within networks. Social network analysis can help us better understand the relationships and cliques that foster and hinder information flows and improve actors' knowledge of the structure of the networks they belong to, how they can work with or against these structures, and how this affects their efforts. It can also help us grapple with issues of centrality and connectedness within networks and what this means for the facilitation, the leadership, and the ownership of networks. So let me give you an interesting example of network analysis. This was done by USAID, uh, analysis of agricultural development. Um, and it's used to look at how relationships or interactions between, uh, between and among community members change over time. This series of pictures uh, maps the interactions in, of farmer producer organizations and main value chain actors in Uganda, uh, in Kamuli during the period 2004 to 2007. Um, the actors include agricultural extension agents, input suppliers, and commodity exporters. This network analysis highlights over time, and it was used as, a, as an ongoing tool, highlights that the producer organized networks, the farmers, were able to make one-to-one -one connections with lead firms and exporters, with suppliers, and with rural savings and credit cooperatives. And over time, these became diverse enough for their, for their project to conclude that they would continue to benefit the farmers regardless of the life of the NGO or the external assistment project. This is a really interesting application of social network analysis in one of the categories of projects that Rick talked about earlier. And I think we should be seeing much more of this kind of thing. 
The next tool or framework I want to talk about is complex adaptive systems. And as Jeff said, this is something that I've been doing quite a lot of work on over the last few years. Complex adaptive systems offers insights for understanding and navigating some of the messiness of network dynamics. If social network analysis says something about structure, then I guess complex adaptive systems says something about movement, about flow. And through uh, complex adaptive systems and the principles that are part of these, uh, this theoretical framework, we can better understand how to facilitate network behaviors that are resilient and robust and relevant to changing context. We can start to think about how to enable self-organization around desired outcomes. We can, better, we can better understand the role of feedback and nonlinear change in tipping points of network activities. For example, trying to understand why relatively low resourced activities can sometimes have a massive effect in the network, whereas massive, uh, massively resourced activities can often uh, be delivered to a, a deafening silence. There's been work that's been done by analysts at the New England School of Complexity Sciences focusing on how networks reach critical points where they're prone to tipping points and nonlinear change, whether it's physically or to do with ideas or to do with values. And in particular, there's been some really interesting analysis done by uh, the people at, at the New England School of how social networks in Egypt reached a point of self-organized criticality, tipping into a mass movement. Uh, what has been referred to as a Gandhi-esque movement without a Gandhi figurehead. The next theory that I want to talk about is actor network theory, and this really is a, a, a profoundly anthropological approach, which helps us to understand the diverse influences that shape social behaviors. So actor network theory is interested in power structures and incentives, and contractual obligations of managers and other workers, is interested in existing technologies and systems and how people interact with them, in, in formal rela informal relationships between people and the habits of network participants. Um, one of the most interesting applications of actor network theory is in exploring the experiences of Fijian bureaucrats and activists at the UN World Conference on Women in Beijing. And the theory helped illuminate the power dynamics and behaviors around international conferences more generally and also helped to highlight what actually was the scope for genuine southern engagement in such events. Finally, the fourth set of ideas that I want to talk about is value network analysis, which sheds light on the patterns and processes of value connection, uh, of value creation for network members, which looks at questions such as how healthy is the network, how well is it generating value for its members, what impact does each input have on the network in terms of value realization? What is the best way for networks to create, extend, and leverage value? And um, this is an interesting example. Again, um, this is the first stage in a value network analysis for what's known as an economic development engine of a, a provincial economic hub in Canada, where the roles of the development engine, local ICT companies, schools, and government agencies were mapped. And then subsequent work was undertaken to analyze the overall balance of the exchange and, and the different strengths and weaknesses of the exchange and the value that they get, gave to the different members and the steps that were required for improvement, if any. Now, I realize this has been a very quick uh, uh, overview of networks. I think the key thing is that a lot of these theories can often seem quite abstract and overcomplicated, but I think there's an analogy with game theory here that is very instructive. You can have very elaborate applications of game theory of maths and equations, but you can also have much simpler principles, rules of thumb, that aid day-to-day -day decision making. And I think the key is to use these theories to derive such principles for day-to-day -day working of networks in ways that are true to the overall conceptual developments, but also add value to what network practitioners are trying to do. So in quick conclusion, this quote here from Network Logic, that we are some way from being able to structure public and organizational power in ways that really harness network potential. This was seven years ago. After the Obama presidential campaign, the Arab Spring, I think we may be a little bit close to structuring public and organizational power. But I think the attention all too often is on network social, uh, social networking tools, which is another form of network rhetoric. I think what we need now uh, for the aid system is a collaborative action research agenda, 
a network collective, if you like, a shared learning project that brings together networks, agencies, analysts, projects and programs focused on furthering practical evidence-based techniques and tools. We'll need open-minded donors who will be willing to fund research in this area, but we also need to make sure that we put network practitioners firmly at the heart of a shared learning agenda. My own experience at ALNAP was that we'd have a lot of people coming to coming to do research on ALNAP as a sector-wide network, then they'd go away and write it up and I'd be none the wiser. I think we need to find somewhere bringing network practitioners into these debates. My own view is that different stakeholders will have different interests in such effort and we need to be able to facilitate this. So network facilitators will be keen to understand better how to energize and sustain their network over time. Network members are perenni perennially asking which networks they should be part of and what contributions they should be making at what cost and with what benefits. Donors are interested in what networks they want they should be funding, why and how they can evaluate things. And I think research and evaluators are keen to find out different ways to further practice in this vital and important area. So clearly such a net collective learning process will need to build on network principles itself. We'll need to make sure that we build take a multidisciplinary approach to understanding networks, bringing together academics, theoreticians and practitioners, and we need to keep a keen eye out for any aid network. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much Ben for that uh, great presentation. I think that that's introduced a lot of uh, good concepts and a lot of good lenses through which the, we can view these various networks, so I'm looking forward to the discussion later. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Enrique Mendizabal and Simon Hearn. Enrique is the director of Mendizabal Limited and is a research associate with the Overseas Development Institute. Um, previously he was the rapid program leader at ODI working on a range of issues, but especially the political economy of research uptake, some practical tools and approaches to policy influence, evaluation, think tanks, and of course networks. You can find out more about his thoughts on his website on thinktanks.org. Uh, he's well known for the development of the Rapid Outcome Mapping Approach, or ROMA, uh, to policy influence, and practical tools like the Alignment Interest and Influence Matrix. But some of his earliest work with Rapid focused on networks, um, and in addition to the multiple working papers, he also has contributed to the aforementioned Network Functions Approach, and is co-author of another paper we'll be discussing today, not everything that connects is a network. Simon is a research officer at RAPID working on knowledge and learning. Uh, his main responsibility is the coordination, facilitation, and development of two networks managed by RAPID, the Outcome Mapping Learning Community, which maybe we have some members here today, which is a global group of advocates, trainers, specialists, and users of outcome mapping, and the Evidence-Based Policy and Development Network, a network of think tanks and research institutes across the Global South dedicated to studying the interface between research, policy, and practice. Building on his practical experience of nurturing these communities of practice, he has contributed to Rapid's thinking on networks and is the co-author of Not Everything That Connects is a Network. So Simon, over to you, or Kike actually, it's over to you, isn't it? Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, I, I, I'm quite impressed at how you remember all that information about us. I'm, I'm guessing you're reading it from somewhere, but if you're not, then it confirms you are a, a fairly good communications officer at, at OBI, so I'm sure you're doing all right in that, yes. Um, okay, so um, we're, we're splitting this presentation into, into two parts. Um, I'll start with setting the stage, um, a bit of the motivation why Simon and I decided to write this paper. And then Simon will go on discussing the discussing the uh, network functions approach um, in more detail. Um, ben has actually said a lot of the things I was planning to say, but much better. So I will I will I might skip some of those uh, comments that I had, um, but it has it, ha it has helped me to um, to make my point. I think one of the things Ben said, and I want to start with that, is that there's a need for a much more concerted effort to understand networks, to design them, to plan them properly. And I think that is what um, Simon and I had in mind uh, when we were uh, working on this uh, paper, although we first worked on a presentation for the Danish Development Research Network, um, and that presentation is the basis of this, of this paper. And at the time, we were concerned that um, 
for quite a few years, we had noticed um, quite a few networks, and I am using the name quite the word quite broadly. Where networks were being set up by donors and by organizations all over the world to deliver their uh, their objectives, whether these were to do research, to influence policy, to train people or organizations, etc. And so networks has, um, as Ben mentioned, and um, a paper I wrote in 2006 said, um, become quite literally a buzzword. Um, and everybody I've been talking to in the last couple of years trying to set up a program tries to set it up as a network, a network of networks, a consortium or a network, an alliance or a network. And so a bit of something that Ben said um, is that it is becoming confusing then to decide what is and what isn't um, a network. But also the, the term and the idea behind it, it's, it's being devalued. Um, and another way of looking at it, in my view, is that when I left ODI um, in December, I spent about a week uh, unsubscribing from a number of uh, news sites and networks and uh, spaces that I had signed up to. It was very easy to join the network on Asian studies, or the network on uh, Latin American politics, or the, the network X, Y, and Z. It was, it was as easy as clicking I like in Facebook. Um, and so the time I dedicated to these spaces was minimal. I didn't remember I had joined them, and, uh, and they were going straight into my junk mail. Or sometimes I was just not even paying attention. Um, and it's not, so it's not only devalued, it's confusing. And not everybody, as Ben, as ben also mentioned, um, not everybody who is managing a network, not everybody who is a member of a network is also a scholar of networks, so is also systematically trying to learn about what works, what doesn't work, etc. Um, so so this, this paper and the work we've been doing in RAPID hasn't been focused on social networks and uh, networks that occur naturally if you want uh, between uh, groups of, uh, of same, with the same backgrounds, uh, schools, professions, etc. Is written mostly for these networks that are being developed uh, or created by funders or by uh, organizations in the developed or developing world uh, to work across countries to influence, to build capacity, to do research, etc. So they're being engineered in a way, another, another comment that um, Ben um, used. And from our point of view, sitting here in um, in, in ODI uh, with um, being DFID, one of our main uh, clients, funders, um, we have been exposed quite a lot to the, the consortium that they've been setting up uh, looking at, um, uh, like the one that uh, uh, Jeff, for instance, works in looking at health policy, education policy, uh, or fragile states growth. And these are being set up as networks, as, as coalitions of coalitions and the uh, complexity of the organization increases sometimes by the day. And we've been working with many of these organizations, finding that they're facing quite a lot of um, challenges. So why the concern is, the concern for us was that too often we found that the network was the automatic strategy um, to deliver a project, to deliver an outcome, or to deliver an objective. And not much um, understanding was going into what this thing was, or why a network and not something else. There were a number of assumptions that are presented to us as arguments for setting up a network over and over again. They're more flexible. They're easier to manage. They're cheaper. They're more sustainable. They're more sustainable, etc. And uh, and there's a great deal of confusion between um, between the members of the network, between the, uh, and with the secretariat. So often we were talking to the network, but in fact we were talking to the secretariat. And when we were told about the members, we really, the people we were working with would really mean the secretariat or the funders or the board of that, of that network, quote unquote. And these, these confusions, which, have, which come from what I was saying, come from this um, sort of confusion that exists in using the word so, uh, so easily and the devalue um, aspect of the, of the concept lead to a number of, uh, of problems. First of all, they're underfunded to network. So one of the things we found in a number of projects, and uh, the most recent one, I was uh, reviewing a communication strategy for a USAID-funded uh, network of networks in the Andean region, 
is that although the network aspect, the community aspect of this initiative was one of the key um, uh, components, the money for networking was minimum compared with the money for influence and the money for capacity building of others. So it's assumed that because all these organizations and people are working together, then the networking will happen. They're being, they're being made to run before they can walk, and they're being made to do things that they're not ready to do. We found this in a study of four networks in Ethiopia where, where donors, um, eager to stop funding projects themselves, decided to use some of the local networks to do the funding. And so they started asking these, these networks that have been set up for coordination, for meeting, for networking, for community building, for sharing, just allocating funds, for example. And in the rushing them to allocate these funds, they ended up uh, weakening them. And I found similar things um, in Ecuador when I was uh, there a couple of weeks ago. They also treated as projects, and I think Ben said it best when he said some people just don't get it. Um, and I think some people just don't get it. They think that a network is just as a project and might as well give it a log frame and specific milestones and everything can be controlled. And it's simply not uh, the case. Um, I said it before about they have been asked to adopt new functions to satisfy their funders, old funders, new funders. I think this continues uh, to happen today. And again, something that Ben emphasized is I think they're being over-engineered. Over and I, the idea that these these organizations are, are sort of complex beings or complex entities leads people to think that they have to come up with complex solutions rather than very specific, I would say even simple interventions. One at a time that put together will not be a simple intervention, but certainly as you implement, it, uh, implement them, they are simple interventions. They are a e that's one email, not 15 different emails to try to address every single audience you might have. They are one event. They are one publication, there are one simple website, one simple email list, etc. So they're not about creating layers and layers to satisfy everybody, it's about making things um, much, much simpler. And that's kind of what's behind the network functions approach that um, Simon will talk about in a, in a second. Um, and I think that the success that this approach has had um, and I measure success by the amount of work that Simon and I have done over the years in uh, advising networks uh, or uh, helping networks to apply it in the way that they've cho chosen to apply it. Um, I think the part of success is that it provided network managers who did not have the time, as Ben was saying, to, to, to study networks and to review what worked and what didn't work or to try to conceptualize the networks in any, in any way. Uh, it, it gave them the opportunity to understand what is it that the network did, the most basic description of their network, in a language that they could understand, their funders could understand, that the members could understand, that other people they worked with could get. And then once they had a common understanding of what the network was doing, they could move on to have a conversation about how to do it. And that is where the research Ben was talking about can come in and be of excellent help, of great help to managers, to members, to funders, Etc. But it's important to have some to have a common understanding first of why is it that we are working um, together? Because then, otherwise, assumptions uh, that are being used uh, right now, um, if proven to be to be wrong uh, or not true, can can delay things and can make things very very difficult. And I so with this, um, we can then use the network functions approach. Hello everybody and uh, this is Simon speaking now. I'm just going to um, talk a little bit about this uh, particular approach that we've developed in ODI um, really over the past five years um, through a number of research and advisory uh, projects. Um, and essentially we're presenting this approach as a way of um, helping networks make strategic decisions. Um, helping people to harness networks better, to facilitate them better, and to uh, also to assess them uh, better. Um, just a, a very quick uh, show of hands. I uh, just want to get a feeling of who's, who's come across or heard about the network functions approach before. Um, so just click your, your hand raising button if you have. Um, this 
because we have um, there's been several publications in the past. Um, Kiki already mentioned his paper in 2006, which um, first looked at it, and um, and you know we're aware of quite a few organisations and networks who have um, already been applying this. So we've got about 11 people with their hands raised. So it's quite good. Um, maybe a lesson there for ODI communications. Um, good. Um, so the the network functions approach, as I said, it, it's um, it's sort of been evolving, and it, it was initially built on a typology of, of functions that was proposed first by um, by Stephen Yeo of the Centre for Economic Policy Research here in the UK. Um, he presented these ideas, and then since then we've uh, sort of taken them and, and applied them in different cases and different research projects. We've adapted them. And slowly it's developed into this approach that we call the Network Functions Approach, or NFA. And the, the NFA combines four um, key elements. It, um, it looks at what we call the, um, the purpose, uh, the role of a network, the functions, and fourthly, the form of a network. And I'll just sort of introduce each, each of these elements in turn. So the, when we talk about the purpose of a network, we're, when we're discussing the purpose, we're establishing the, the, the justification for its existence. You know, it's, it's where we begin to express the value of a strategy that harnesses networks rather than some other form of organization. And implicit in the purpose of a network is an expression of uh, how this network is going to be put to use, a kind of theory of change of, of the network and how it's, uh, you know, the, the proposition of, of how a network strategy is going to be effective in this particular situation. Um, it's important to distinguish the purpose of the network from the purpose of the Secretariat uh, or, or, or whatever um, organizing function is being um, proposed in the network. Um, often people confuse the two, and often we we t we begin by saying what a secretariat will do, how the secretariat will behave. Uh, you know, what's the the, um, the sort of the, the goals and the timelines and the project plans of a secretariat, rather than actually talking about the network as a whole. And I apologise if you can hear the police car going past. We are in central London here. Um, so the, the difference between the, the, the network itself and the secretariat that's supporting the network needs to be explicated at, at this early um, stage. The second element that, that the network functions approach introduces is the idea of a role of a network. And the role describes how the network promotes value among its members in pursuit of the purpose. And then in, in this approach, we propose two uh, kind of archetypal roles, uh, support and agency. But in reality, we recognize that actually the, the role will exist along a spectrum between these two. So firstly, we have the, the support role. And in support networks, members operate as uh, distinct agents of change. They each have their own identity. They each operate um, in their own environment, but uh, overlapping with their, their fellow members. Um, but the, the main thing is that they, they engage with each other in, in the network. They network with, with other organizations in order to receive support. To, to make what they're doing more effective. So in an agency network, by contrast, members are coordinating their efforts with other members. And they're sort of acting as a single agent of change, um, coordinating their efforts um, under one banner. The functions is the, the third element that uh, the NFA introduces. And it describes in more detail what the network is doing. 
And in the past, we've presented six distinct functions based on the original uh, typology that was developed by Stephen Yeo. Um, but we often find that these six um, need sort of adapting and refining when it comes to applying them to a network. And people often play around with them and change the, you know, change the name of the functions and change the slight nuance of the functions. And we've also recently come across several um, similar typologies which um, pr present functions, but, but they have slight differences. And so in order to, uh, to sort of combine them and to recognize these other typologies, we've decided um, in, in this paper to develop uh, groups of functions and to generalize them into broader categories. Um, so in this particular adaptation of the network functions approach, we are presenting five categories of functions. The, the first is uh, functions around knowledge management. And these describe how networks can be used to identify, to, uh, to filter, to exchange, and to package knowledge. And the knowledge can take um, quite a variety of forms, but um, most notably, probably, um, it's, it's about events and, and research and stories and also contacts, people. Secondly, we have functions around amplification and advocacy. And these describe how networks can be used to bring um, important issues and evidence to the fore. And they, they can be used also to translate or publicize the ideas of its members. Then we have uh, community building functions. And these describe how networks can be used to develop shared visions, to promote and sustain core values and to build strong relationships. Fourthly, there's uh, convening functions. And these describe how networks can be used to bring um, groups of people together who wouldn't normally interact, who wouldn't normally cross paths, and to, to build consensus and coherence among these groups. And then there's uh, functions to do with mobilizing resources. Um, and these describe how networks manage resource dependencies, how they can be used to distribute funding, um, but also to provide um, other services to enhance the capacity or the effectiveness of members. And it's, it's important to note that a network isn't limited to a single function. Many networks are multifunctional, but there does tend to be um, a more dominant function at any particular time. Um, we also notice that the, the functional balance of a particular network will change over time in response to changing priorities or changing contexts. Um, often when we, we think of these functions, it's easy to think of them as being the activities of the secretariat or the coordinator. But this isn't, this isn't what they're intended to be. The, the point of these functions is that they are uh, they're carried out by or through the network itself. The secretariat obviously plays a key role in facilitating these functions and enabling the members to, to carry these functions out. But they are not alone in carrying them out. If, if all we had was a, an organization carrying out these functions, then there's actually no case for a network there. We can easily just set up a, some kind of service delivery organization, which would be more effective. Um, similarly, a network, I mean, it doesn't have to have a supporting entity to carry out the functions, although we find that most of the networks we look at um, do opt for that approach. So the fourth element that the NFA introduces is, is the form. And this describes what the network looks like uh, physically. And there are a number of factors which affect the form of a network. I'm not going to go into detail about all of these. Um, they're, they're written up in some of our previous work. Um, but I wanted to pick out a couple of um, considerations uh, for the first, the first couple of, of these uh, factors that might be particularly pertinent for planning networks. The first is uh, for membership. Um, it's crucial to consider membership in a network because I mean, essentially, networks aren't created out of nothing. You can't just 
um, magic and network into being. Um, they build on existing relationships between people and between organizations. They build on shared priorities and common objectives and similar interests. And these things exist before a network is formalized. Another consideration is that the boundaries of a, a network can be difficult to define because it's not as simple as being in or out. You know, there are degrees of membership depending on the depths of the relationships that exist and the commitment that different members have towards the purpose of the network. You know, just as Enrique mentioned earlier, um, you could be part of a number of different networks, often on the periphery, often not as a, a formal member, but through uh, informal relationships. But it's the strength of these relationships that will determine many of the characteristics of the network. Um, characteristics such as the, the levels of trust, the accountability mechanisms, the, the sort of microstructure, uh, and the way that ideas diffuse through a network are all dependent upon the, the strength of the ties that exist between the members of a network. Um, and different functions will require uh, different sort of uh, configurations of relationships and configuration and strengths of relationships. On governance, um, there's some important things to say about this. The the rules and norms of networks um, are not always as explicit as they are in in hierarchical organisations. They're often there are often a lot of tacit understandings that go on within networks. Um, there are different levels of formality. Um, sometimes things can be very formal, sometimes things can be um, completely informal. This level of centralization differs a lot as well. Some networks have a very centralized hub and spoke model, and some networks are much more distributed with, with no clear center of leadership. The processes and structures that exist within a network often emerge and evolve over time uh, in response to the, the needs of the members, in response to changes in the context. These, these different arrangements can also be nested within each other. Um, and there can be varying degrees of detail about the different uh, organizational structures. Um, Networks with a lot of detail can often um, maintain a lot more diversity within the network, and whereas networks with a lot less detail, a lot more homogeneous structure, will often have to rely on stronger ties between members. And there's just a final note about, um, really about attention. You know, networks require a lot of care and attention, not just by those that are facilitating and coordinating them, but by the members themselves. People have divided priorities, there's a lot of competition out there, and without regular attention from the members of a network, the network will diminish and it will, um, its, its sort of value proposition will decrease. And this is why stewardship is often necessary some kind of uh, leadership within a network uh, that is making sure that um, value is, is, is existent, that members are contributing to each other, that aren't just um, going off in separate directions, but are pulling together and, and maintaining some, some level of coherence. So these are just some of the some of the issues that we discuss in the paper. Um, and it's really just to put some of our ideas out there and to, um, to explain some of, the, some of the things that we've been thinking and to spark some discussion, really. So we're, we're really looking forward to hearing your response, to hearing how, how these ideas are relevant to, to your work and essentially seeing if there's interest for developing some of these ideas and developing some, um, turning it into more uh, practical, um, you know, advice and, and tools. 
Um, so I think I shall stop there and hand back to um, Jeff and just see where this uh, discussion can lead us. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation, Simon and Kike. I think that um, at the very least it should challenge some of our ideas of, of what networks are, and I'm already seeing lots of questions both in the back channel chat and through some of the chats uh, facilities that we have here um, uh, about what this has to offer. So the way that this next session is going to work is um, we're, we're adopting um, what they call a fishbowl model, where we will we have two discussants, Rick Davies, who I will introduce shortly, and uh, Nancy White, who will kind of share their reflections. They have up to five minutes each. As we're doing that, for the various participants, feel free to ask questions using either the chat box that uh, Simon flagged earlier for the question box. Now, these questions will go to uh, me and the other panelists, and what I will do is I will actually read out those questions as we open up the discussion after Nancy and Rick have a chance to talk to the presenters and the discussants. Uh, as you're asking the questions, if I can please ask that you include um, a little bit of background information, including uh, well, who you work for and uh, where you are joining us from. So basically organization and location. With that, um, I will introduce Rick Davies, um, who is an independent uh, monitoring and evaluation consultant with a special interest in using social network analysis and program evaluation. So I'm looking forward to hearing his thoughts on some of the different frameworks uh, that Ben presented on, on looking at networks. His M&D News website provides resource materials on uses of uh, social network analysis along with news on recent developments in m and &E. uh, So Rick, over to you for your thoughts and reflections on these presentations. Hi. Um, hello to everyone. Thanks for, uh, for being here. I notice we've got 86 attendees and uh, six other people, including myself, uh, helping uh, present this whole event. Uh, so welcome. Um, I noticed one of the things that was being discussed in the, uh, on the chat page was the issue of what is a network. And I thought I might just make a quick comment on that. Um, there are two different sorts of uh, uses of this term. One is to pose a distinction between networks and hierarchies as sort of opposing cases, and that, uh, that thread, I think, runs through uh, both papers. Um, the other approach is, to, uh, which comes from a social network analysis back, uh, perspective, which is where I'm coming from, is to say that actually um, hierarchies are a type of network structure. They're a very sparse network structure rather than a dense network structure. Um, so I'm coming from the angle that sees networks in very broad terms as actors connected by kinds of relationships within which there are hierarchies and uh, within which there are more voluntary um, structures which uh, Ben and, um, and Simon and Enrique have referred to as networks. Uh, often which we're calling uh, named networks. Uh, when I was listening to uh, uh, the, the last paper, uh, Simon and Enrique's paper, I suppose one of my questions, uh, thinking about the networks function approach, uh, which was how has that approach been used? It's, it's a way of perceiving and looking at networks. It'd be interesting to, in the discussion to hear back, how has that approach been used? Um, a second question I had in my mind, and I'll share all these, a written text of these uh, over the chat page when I finished, is the idea of facilitating a shared vision in, in networks. Um, the importance of doing this was stressed in, in Simon and Enrique's paper, but the question is, how do you do that? Because it's, it's, to me, um, unlike a normal organization or a project where you can start off with a defined objective and then try and Im implement activities to achieve it, in a network, um, agreement over objectives strikes me as something that is achieved over a, over a period of time rather than the starting point. So how do you facilitate the development of shared objectives in networks of the kind that uh, Simon and Ben are talking about and Enrique? Um, another question about in Simon and uh, Enrico's paper is whether they've 
come across the literature on the relative merits uh, and performances of teams versus hierarchical structures in organizations. There's a literature on this that goes back quite a few decades um, and is relevant to the discussion of teams and, and the inefficiency, sorry, the discussion of networks and their inefficiencies, which is touched upon in their paper. Um, basically, from my memory of this literature, um, it was established uh, quite some time ago that hierarchical structures are good for working with problems which are stable and decomposable. So organizing a production line where you, you've got to produce a car, you can make a car out of various bits and the design of the car remains stable over time, well a hierarchical structure for organizing a production line works. But teams which have more a fluid uh, membership and, and relationships, i.e. a type of network, work better with problems which can be described as fluid and entangled, not easy to de de decompose and allocate to individual people to look after individual parts. Um, I'll just qu quickly move on to Ben's paper. Um, I thought his, uh, the section of his paper, which I hope is available to everybody who's participating here, uh, where he looks at the contrast between networks and hierarchies and tries to identify the key differences, I thought it was quite useful. If I was going to try and simplify that distinction even further. I would say that the key difference between networks, as they're talking about, and hierarchies is the voluntary nature of people's participation in those relationships. That makes a huge difference to um, how diverse and varied the relationships are and how fluid those relationships are over time. If you're, a, if you're a sort of in a contractual relationship with others, you're bound to certain rules about who you can talk to and, and when you have to be available to be talked to. Um, the question of a theory of change popped up, I think, at one stage in the discussion. And one question, I think, in when we're looking at voluntary networks uh, is how do you take, if you're trying to evaluate a, a network, how would you evaluate a network if you're coming from a theory of change approach to evaluation? which is what a lot of people do these days. They try and identify the theory of change behind what a project is trying to do and then see whether it was successfully implemented and if it was successfully implemented, whether it achieved its objectives. But in a network of mem people who are there as voluntary members, each with their own perspective and where uh, agreement on objectives may be developing over time may and maybe not, how do you develop a single theory of change on which you can then evaluate that their activities. I think there are ways of doing this, but I think it poses particular challenges. Um, there are a couple of other issues I'll touch upon very briefly. The problem of incomplete data when you're trying to document the structure of networks. Um, ben uh, deals with this in his paper, and my point here is that I think uh, it is an issue, but I think in some respects it's an issue in all attempts to model or describe what is going on in a particular situation and it simply happens to be a bit more in your face when you're doing a network representation where you can clearly see there are some actors included and some relationships included and others not. Um, I think I might skip one or two other points there. Um, the discussion of complexity is covered in Ben's paper. And I think one interesting area uh, worth exploring is how we can uh, develop more dynamic network models of what uh, development project activities are all about and how we can move from simple static descriptions of those projects and static uh, models to more dynamic models where they actually simulate what happens in a, in a development project. In other words, we see processes of change taking place in those models. That's been, um, simulations have been used in trying to work out what's going on with climate change. Um, there'll be a quote there in the document which I'll share with you shortly. Uh, just quickly on the value network analysis, I thought that had potential to take further in terms of looking at the whole aid industry, inverted commas, and the supply chains involved in that and the efficiencies and inefficiencies of the movement of information and goods and money through that supply chain. In terms of looking into the future, um, just two broad comments there. One about the, the network functions approach. I think um, the, the software and the language and terminology of social network analysis could help operationalize some of the terms used in the network functions approach. It could help uh, get more accurate and, and um, 
uh, useful descriptions of the nature of network forms and structures and relationships. And more generally, I think in uh, applying to both papers, I think the the, the future for network analysis uh, in the area of development aid is to make it more participatory. It comes from an academic background. It tends to treat uh, participants at, uh, uh, in networks as subjects who provide data and not much else. But the subjects in all these networks have views, and they probably have views on the networks that they're members of. And the challenge, I think, is to, is to develop more participatory ways of mapping networks and and analyzing networks involving the actors in those networks in that process of mapping and analyzing and planning. And I suspect this is something that Nancy might have something to say, who I will now uh, hand over to. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting here and nodding strongly. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to quickly introduce you, Nancy, as the owner of Full Circle Associates based in Seattle, Washington. So thank you so much for joining us at what is, what, 7 in the morning now. Um, as a technology and community steward, she's designed and implemented numerous online communities from Share Your Story to Electric Minds to Woman to Women. Um, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts, Nancy. Thanks. Um, you know, it's been really fun because I've been following the, the Networks Approach work of all this gang at ODI since they first came out have used it, twisted it, put it to evil purposes, redefined it in my own way so many times. And what I really appreciate about both these papers is helping us recognize how to talk about this because I think we do struggle with language here significantly. And that um, when we talk about networks, a person A and person B could be having a conversation and talk about completely different things. And so. Um, it, it's lovely to have this opportunity to look across a little bit. And first I'd like to just throw out a couple of words that came to me both as I read the papers, heard the talks, followed as much as I can the chat in the Tangler and um, listening to Rick's response. And, and it's a word I haven't really heard too much. And that is the word control. And when we think about funders and organizations and people with good intent who are trying to make positive change in the world, they want to get an outcome. And there is some connection between their desire to get that outcome and their desire or need or mandate to control the process to get there. And what networks seem to have introduced or thinking about networks is this idea that we can have horizontality, that we can connect multiple actors, that we can use the power of those connections to create change beyond, for example, a pilot project, that can something that can scale and sustain, and at the same time wanting to control it. And there's a tension there that is not ever fully resolvable, which I think is a fine thing. But I don't know that we've learned how to organizationally live with that tension that network opportunities bring to us, both as participants as funders, as facilitators, and you know, as we see, there's a lot of facilitators in here. And I'm looking at the chat. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues about people who grapple with this in a day-to-day -day practice. So I think, kind of putting that elephant a little more visible in the room about control might be useful, and the the elephant around language, um, so that if we get to a more nuanced way of talking about when we use the word network, and we put some definitions as P. Cranston suggested in the chat, that might be a really useful practice. I also want to hearken back to something that there's some assumptions that, that I think show up in both papers that I wonder about, which is that networks are new and that they're, they're a post-machine thing, when in fact I think networks are very fundamentally human and have been around for eons before we had machine, before we had language to talk about it. Um, and that what is significantly different now is how technology has changed our experience of networks. Okay? It means we can belong in more ways. And this idea of belonging to a network goes to some of the comments that everybody has talked about, attention and agency and efficiency and scale all go to how much attention we can pay to this, both as people who are initiating or facilitating and people who, who work in it. Um, 
that the technology has changed what it means to belong to a network. It has given us the opportunity to belong to more networks than we can cognitively, I think, handle. And it has given us the ability to visualize these networks in ways that I don't think most of our, you know, kind of human brains can visualize. So the network mapping, in fact, changes our experience of being in that network as we see it in a new way. So these experiences are really an important shift. And I think it's a shift that, that institutions haven't quite figured out in many ways from their, their, their particular type of network structure, which is a hierarchy. Because I tend to agree with, Nick, to, with Rick that you know, all these human aggregations are different network, network uh, formations. So to, to, to pull that down from this kind of talky-talky standpoint, what does that mean in practice? And so we're working with a group of folks who have been funded by the Packard Foundation and a bunch and six other foundations to look at their grantees and how they use quote unquote networks in their work. And this has been uh, we're eight months into a nine month experiment, and it's been very interesting to see how difficult it has been to live with the tension of how we use both the formal or the big N networks and the informal, what we've been calling the little end networks, strategically in one's work, and to do it in a way that fits into someone's job description and their funder's log frame. So that when people are given the freedom to re-explore their work from this network perspective, they start seeing things they didn't see before. When they try to implement that practice, they're running into lots of barriers. So, and it's taken a long time for our group to, you know, in fact, I think only about 25% of our group has kind of moved past this sort of conceptual model and started to apply it to our work. So a woman who is facilitating a network of people who are providing services for low-income children in a geographic area in rural Northern California, particularly drug and alcohol impacted children whose moms use drug and alcohol during pregnancy, that there's this very intricate and not well understood referral network. And the referrals are very challenging for families, but the providers always see it in terms of their job description. When they remapped it to seeing how the referral patterns go between them, the conversation is starting to change. Okay? They're starting to see what needs to be formalized in their network, what doesn't need to be formalized, and how it appears to the people they're trying to serve, which is a mess. And it's changing their conversation about their work. And for me, that is a significant value here. It's not about the big N networks that we set up or not, but about shifting the perspective that we can see. And I think both these papers are bringing some of those things to the foreground. But, but I think we need more stories of practice. So I guess I'll close with what are the stories of practice now? If we have a network framework or we have the four approaches that that, that Ben has suggested. What are the stories of practice that can inform our conversation? So thus jumping out of the fishbowl. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Um, what I want to do now, before I throw out any new questions, I'm curious if Ben, Enrique, uh, Simon, if any of you have any thoughts or reflections on any of those comments. I would also remind the um, presenters that if you're typing, we can usually hear that. So if you can refrain from typing on the open mic, that would be great. So Ben, Kike? Should we go in order? Ben, do you want to start or should I, since I am talking now, should I just go? You're not talking, Kike, so go for okay, it. Great. Okay. Um, I mean, I have two comments, two things that I noted down um, um, with us about the, uh, the way that the network functions approach is used. I think that um, Ben can also talk about that. He's used it um, quite a lot as well. But um, as I think as Simon said, it's been used um, by a number of organizations in different ways. Um, we've used it in planning, and, and, and we have used it uh, in planning the outcome of a learning community, uh, different stages, for example. Um, it's been used in evaluating or if you want learning from the experience of networks. I, I carried out a peer uh, learning process in Ethiopia looking at uh, four different networks. And in that case what we did is instead of going through the steps that Simon suggested, so sorting out your functions before you decide how to structure it, 
we looked at how the structure was affecting the functions or was affecting the desired function. So looking at it from the other way. Um, and then we've used it for uh, various reviews and I think the most recent one was one Simon and I participated in um, looking at um, INEE. Um, in this case I think it goes into the sort of humanitarian side uh, Ben will know more about. But it was used as a, as a review mechanism to sort of um, to check whether everybody was on board uh, in terms of the, the, the purpose, the roles, the functions of the network and then review the structure to see if it was helping them to deliver what they wanted to deliver. And then the second point I wanted to stress was in response to something uh, Rick said, which I think is quite, is quite important, is, is, is how to evaluate networks. And I think here the problem is um, what is it that we are evaluating? And I would agree with um, what I think Rick meant in terms of evaluating a network. You look at the strength of the relationships, the, uh, the, the, the strength of the ties that exist. Um, but actually what, what tends to happen is uh, network evaluations tend to be about what the network does. So it's about evaluating the network's influence on policy or evaluating the network's uh, capacity development work or evaluating uh, the network's uh, research. So, so we're not looking at evaluating networking, we're looking at evaluating the things this entity, uh, this space, this group has been doing um, uh, with others. Just to, just to follow on from that, the network functions approach, um, we used it in ALNAP to develop a five-year strategy and it was used by um, ADRRN and we've actually got Nick here from ADRRN on the, um, on the chat uh, today to develop their three-year strategy as well in combination with the World Cafe methodology. It's been used also by a couple of private sector organizations that I know of, um, Shell being one of them, to understand their own global communities. I think there's, there's been some really interesting applications. Usually the most, the most helpful thing is actually to get some shared understanding of what we're talking about. It really resonates with the point Nancy made about language, that, that you have so many different uh, perspectives in a network, so many different diversities, so much diversity of opinion and, and thought and practice, that having a shared language to actually talk about your common goals can be really useful in, in starting to harness what you're going to do together. And the lack of that shared language can often inhibit networks at the outset, uh, and when they come to critical strategic decision making, when it comes to working out how a network should evolve. That, that's, that's really um, what it was. It was, a, it was a set of ideas which, which we used in a number of different settings to facilitate that, um, an effective dialogue. But I think the most important thing really is about the, the conversations that are having, happening within networks the, and, and the quality of those conversations and how those conversations are um, shaping people's day-to-day -day practices and their shared goals. And this is where I really come down and um, uh, although the paper which I wrote was very much on the drawing on theory side of things and that was what it was, um, that was the terms of reference for it, very much come down on the side of what Nancy was talking about, you know, how, how do we move down from the conceptual stuff to the day-to-day -day practice? If you are facing the challenge of working with a multidisciplinary network or being part of a multidisciplinary network, how do you make the most of that experience? And um, do we have the right kinds of language to even talk about that thing in a shared way? Just on the chat window, I think we're seeing some really interesting examples of people um, coming up with conceptual blockages or, or points where we, it's clear that we need, to, we need to work a bit more on the language side of things before we can actually have effective conversations. And there's some areas where clearly there's a lot of consensus, that there's, a, there's a lot of shared experience. And I think um, getting together and talking about it and, and sharing what I say, what I said in my presentation, the tacit side of networking. Which, and it still is predominantly tacit knowledge. I think that, that's, that's the key to taking this area forward, um, trying to make it uh, sense-making, maybe very useful, getting people to tell stories. Ian Thorpe put a really interesting post up, I think it was earlier today or yesterday, about a workshop with Etienne Wenger in which he talked about the role of stories and talking about people's experiences. That's something we haven't really heard enough about today, I think. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, I don't know. Thanks.
Ben? I don't know if there are any specific questions. Um, sure, we have a lot of questions from around. Um, I'm, there were a few yeah, on a similar question. strand. Um, so let, let, let me start with these questions and then Jeff, we can... Jeff, can I just say uh, something? Yep, go for it, Simon. Sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to... Uh, I, I was just having a couple of thoughts uh, in response to, to Rick and Nancy's um, interesting comments. Um, the, the main thing was that the, the, it's clear from from their um, sort of reactions that there's a lot of terminology and a lot of concepts that are applied to networks that come from other um, other fields, other kinds of uh, ways of thinking about things. Things you know, they mentioned um, uh, visions and outcomes and uh, objectives and theories of change, and we apply these things a lot in in, in the projects that we run and. It's yeah. I think there's there's a definite uh, need to think about what these things mean for networks. Um, I think they will they will look different in networks, uh, and we've tried to sort of clarify um, what some of these things look like for networks. But I'm not sure we've we're, in, we're there yet. I'm not sure we've got complete clarity on uh, what it is that. Um, that, that makes these things different within networks. Um, I think one of the things that can really help is to actually recognize that, you know, that when we say networks, we actually, that there are a variety of different things we're talking about, especially if we include the definition to, to uh, include, uh, you know, hierarchies, um, as, as Rick and Nancy are, are suggesting. Then, um, then the spectrum of, of things that are called networks suddenly expands um, exponentially and therefore these it becomes much more important to think about what kind of network we're talking about before we think about these uh, what what a theory of change would look like what an outcomes uh, what outcomes mean for that thing um, for example very loose um, networks social networks for example um, these things are going to be very difficult to apply because everyone's going to have very very uh, different opinions it's going to be hard to uh, t to identify consensus, let alone uh, reach it. Um, but for more centralized, more um, organized, more formal networks, it's, it may be easier to see how some of these things apply. Um, there, are, there may be more formal processes for developing theories of change. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I particularly liked Rick's comment about how, for example, um, a shared vision would evolve over time. I think that's um, a very important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for Thank now. Simon, can I direct a question to you? Because there's actually been quite a few questions in the, the various chat mechanisms that we have about this distinction between a community of practice versus a network. And I know we're here talking um, terminology. So I'm curious if you see some sort of definition between those. Um, and I mean, is, is a community more loose, more natural? Is a network more constructed? I know that you uh, facilitate several, uh, what you would call a community of practice. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, well, I mean, as I understand it, a community of practice is, 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 um, has quite a, a particular definition that's been Sort of, um, sort of developed by um, you know a particular uh, particular group of people coming out of the knowledge management domain. Um, Etienne Wenger is one of the proponents. Um, I mean, this is this is very much the sort of realm of, of Nancy. Actually, you know, she she's written quite a lot of, and spoken quite a lot about the distinction between uh, communities and networks. So, after I've had a go, I'll, I'll um, let her. Um, Give give her opinion, but um, I think it, in my in my opinion, I think a community of practice is, is is a type of network. It's a particular type of network where um, a group of people are are coming together around a practice, around something that they do um, that is common. Uh, that they develop that practice in a community, and they. Um, you know they have particular ways in which they do that. Um, in a, many online communities are 
uh, are sometimes referred to as communities of practice, I think uh, that would need to be um, clarified. We, we actually, the, the outcome mapping community, we actually identify ourselves as a, a virtual learning community rather than um, a community of practice. Um, maybe that's just another uh, confusing discussion of terminology. But um, yeah, Nancy, perhaps you can explain that a little bit clearer. Well, explain it, I'm not sure, because my perception, understanding, and practice of communities of practice has expanded so much with my move into work, working with more open, less bounded groups that typically I've called networks. So my past definitions, I think, were insufficient, and I suffered from my own problem of language. But what has been useful for me from the communities of practice uh, work is taking a communities of practice perspective for talking about my networks. Because when Etienne Wenger and John Smith and I started writing Digital Habitats, um, we were really thinking about bounded, very defined communities of, of people who were learning together over time around a specific domain. But as we started looking at the impact of technology, what we noticed more and more is that the boundaries were blown away by technology which allowed people to connect in new ways, not just in their geographic work team or geographic space or within their company. And that, that was a breakthrough for me. And then I could carry the, the what uh, I think Ben talked about earlier is the CPD model, the community domain and practices being the three legs of the stool of community of practice, and say, I don't care whether something is or isn't a community of practice, but that framework is actually a useful for, way for me to say, you know, where have we been, who we are, where are we going? And so, you know, I think community defines what kind of relationships we have with each other. Are they hierarchical? Are they bounded? Are they very open? You know, earlier this week when we were trying to find a chat room for, for this, I didn't know, I can't keep up with all the technology, even though that's, that's supposedly what I do. And so I asked my Twitter network, and the people who gave me answers, half of them I knew and half of them I didn't know. A couple of those people I know were in this chat room until recently. Um, did it matter that I had a close relationship with the people who answered me? No, it didn't. So in that case, the definition of the relationships are very loose. I may never interact with those people again, or I may find that interaction was so powerful that I want to get to know them better. So, there's different ways in different kinds of networks to define a community. Likewise for practice, what we do together, the activities we do, are they very structured or are they, you know, kismet? What happens today because I happen to be paying attention, but it won't happen tomorrow because I can't pay attention. Very different sorts of practices. And of course, domain is an interesting thing across these different kinds of networks. For me, the more bounded and more focused communities really have a more bounded and focused domain. So that, I think, is something really interesting. And the broader networks, where Rick talked about you know, facilitating towards agreement, or in the chat room we talk about how you know, networks, particularly distributed or online networks, make decisions. Well, in fact, they may not, because their domain is not fully shared. It intersects. You know, I'm a little bit interested in that, and you have this peripheral interest. And therefore, there's no way we could ever get to consensus or decision making. But that's OK, because there's still a lot of stuff that's happening there in terms of learning or innovation or ideas or spreading of means. So when we think about scaling, that openness and that lack of consensus can actually be a real positive asset. OK, I'm waving my hands again too much. But too much <laughs> caffeine. No, thanks, Nancy. Um, another set of questions came in. Uh, there's a good reflection here from Sarah Huxley, who worked with the Diffin CSO Youth Working Group. And her reflection is that there's a real issue of power and inclusion or exclusion with regard to networks. Those not involved are less likely to do or practice X, which is surely the point of them. Networks should be a mechanism to change, not just to advocate. So we have a, a thought in there about uh, power, inclusion, and exclusion. And there is a question from Nada Kadoda, a university lecturer in Khartoum, uh, who asks, in the development context, how can one work around negative ties, uh, for example, ethnicity, when it is a dominant strength factor in a network? So I'm curious if any of you have thoughts on power. I guess it goes back a little bit to some of the questions on hierarchies. Inclusion, exclusion. Uh, 
everybody's on mute. Ben? Hi. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess both these are really relevant to, I mean, the, to, to the presentation that I gave, particularly I think the power piece. Um, it, when you talk about networks, particularly networks that require some degree of online um, uh, interaction, that there is no doubt that um, particularly within the development community, people, fr people from developed countries tend to access those far more than people in developing countries. So research that we did at ALNAP identified that tools like social network tools, like um, uh, intranets, like, um, network, um, even things like coordination meetings were far less accessed by national staff within development agencies than they were by international staff. So there's a, there's a power and exclusion issue in terms of the kinds of voices we seem to want within networks and who is permitted or allowed or encouraged to speak in network settings and who isn't. And so, so that there's that issue within the sector that um, we need to tackle alongside tackling the deeper thing that I think um, Sarah was talking about, which is um, the, the people that international agencies are actually trying to help, to, that they're trying to serve the um, poor and vulnerable people in developing country context. And I, and I think it is linked to this, this negative tie thing that our colleague from Khartoum raised, that we, we unfortunately network with people that are like us on the whole. If you look at the maps of Facebook and Twitter, um, there's a real disparity. It, it, it's great when you see the connections actually happen, but Social network analysis has shown that they're massive cliques, that people in America and Europe tend to talk to people in Europe when they talk to people in other countries, and not so much to people in Africa, and so on. And, and in many ways, the aid system uh, is a reflection of the wider uh, global system of which it is a part. And I don't think you're going to be able to get away from that. The, the key point is that networks can't transform human relations. They don't transform power dynamics. They may give us a more useful way of addressing some common problems, but we should expect all the same issues that we have in any other kind of setting to come up in networks. They shouldn't be seen as a means by which we can transform society um, in and of themselves. They, they're there to serve certain broader strategic goals. It will be, it will be nice and certainly my own value base would lead me to hope that we can do things along those lines. We can develop networks that cut across language, that cut across ethnicity, that address issues of gender, but um, I don't see it happening that much. Ben, can I respond Rich? to one thing you said? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I can just respond to one thing that Ben said. Um, uh, it's about this issue of inclusion and exclusion, on, particularly on online networks. Um, I think what happens varies quite a lot uh, in different settings. I know on my website, m &E News, that the majority of users are from, the, from North America, Europe and Australasia. But when I look at the membership of the, the m &E News email list, um, it's a very different picture. I think the bulk of the members are in Africa and Asia, and I think probably the bulk of the active participating members are also in Africa and Asia. Um, so I found, I've found that very interesting, that difference. Um, the other thing is the role of uh, moderators in email lists. What you find, or what I've found, is I'm, I'm basically there as a sort of, I'm there to maintain the boundaries, and whatever happens inside the boundaries, um, I leave pretty much well alone. But my boundary maintenance role is in terms of um, basically just the type of contributions that people make, you know, anything that's offensive or clearly out of subject, um, I, I will not allow in, but everything else, regardless of whether I agree with it or disagree with it, so long as it's on topic, I allow it. Um, and I think this raises the question of, of how, one, you know, one question I think here is how do you make the role of a moderator in an online network more accountable? Uh, can this be done through some sort of transparency mechanism? And I'd be interested to hear um, from other people who are listening in um, whether they've got any advice or views on this. Can I, can 
I just come back very quickly on that? The, um, Sarah who, from DIPID, who made the point, actually makes a very important point, which I think builds on what you're saying, that, as well as email moderators, that the whole point of network facilitation being a means by which, um, let me just find the message, she said that facilitation plays a really important role in addressing issues of exclusion. I think that's, that's a really important point that we don't, often we don't pay enough attention to, that facilitators do need to bring the, the voices together and make sure that there's an uh, equal platform for everyone and that the quiet voices are, uh, have, uh, have, have, a, have a platform, I guess, and ha have an equal say in the network. But this is one of the issues that we faced when we were when I worked in ALNAP, and ALNAP is a, we, was a unique, or an, and is a unique sector-wide network, because it brought together the donors, the UN agencies, the NGOs, the Red Cross, academics and researchers and freelance consultants, all of whom had an interest in humanitarian learning and humanitarian performance. And it was seen as a, as a, uh, as a horizontal network where the power disparities didn't really matter. It didn't matter that you were a donor with huge amounts of money. You would have to talk on an equal footing with an NGO. And I think that's part of the reason why people supported it and liked it, was that it, it, it was set up in that space. But it required frequent, frequently required people to actually preserve that space, that you know, they, they, no organization should be allowed to dominate, that it, no, no perspective or value set should be allowed to dominate, that when we needed to expand the network, it, it, it sometimes became challenging because people had worked so hard to achieve equality within the within that diverse setting that actually the idea of bringing in another group that could potentially disrupt that was really challenging. So I think it's something that you need to be constantly thinking about when you're facilitating a network. And, and sometimes I think, again, this is where theory falls down. I think theory doesn't really tell us much about that very human problem. Excellent. Thank you. Um, as we're talking a little bit about online networks, we have Renata Marula from the FAO at Rome who facilitates um, an online network. And uh, she was curious if you thought there were any specific features of online networks versus other types of network. Maybe Kike, do you want to answer that one? Um, I will let Simon give you the specific features. I will just give you a sort of a, uh, a word of warning, I think. And is that, um, and I've come across this uh, many times in the last uh, couple of years. And is the the idea that the network um, in developing the networks and setting them up or planning what to do, the um, the internet is is the main space or the main way in which everything is is done. Everything is connected. So it's not uh, a tool. So um, Twitter, Facebook, uh, these type of tools we're using now, uh, email, the online space created for the community, etc., is not just a tool used by the members to connect and to engage, but is is the thing, is the way it's um, it's done. And so it's completely dependent on a technology that is changing as we speak. Um, half the things we're using today I had not seen before, uh, and I'm sure that they probably won't be around in a year if somebody else will have replaced it. So we have to be very careful when we when we talk about, I, I think we have to be very careful when we talk about uh, online networks um, as if they were something completely different. I think what Simon and I were trying to say is that the relationships between the members matter and they cannot be entirely dependent on uh, on having the, 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 you know, the Twitter or having the, the email. There has to be something, something else, and I have shared um, a short article I wrote with Stephen Yu um, uh, about a year ago on um, on 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 networks, on think nets, um, and and we we were discussing why is it that there are so many economic um, economic research, economics networks around the world um, that are quite quite strong, quite quite powerful, but also that that cross uh, country boundaries and regional boundaries. And, and how difficult it is to set these things up for other disciplines. And he thought, well, it's because you can be an economist anywhere you go. You can be an economist in a bank, in an NGO, you can be an economist in a university, but other disciplines tend to force you to stay within a particular field of work and, and, and move in a, in a much smaller uh, space. And so, as Ben was saying, the people you engage with are much closer to you. 
was in economics, you can work in a bank and end up talking to somebody working in an NGO in uh, any the other uh, part of the other sort of side of the, side of the world um, has a job that has nothing to do with yours, but you're using the same the same language. Um, so that that would be my 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 comment about online networks. It's, it's more about to do with why you come together, who you are in relationships, rather than the actual onlineness of things. Yeah, and I would I just you can add... wrap that around to a question that we had, and then Simon, I'll move on to you. Sorry. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Go is, for is, it. is that okay, Simon? I have a question in that for KK, and then we'll we'll send it back to you. Um, the you you pointed out in your discussion, KK, that uh, you had a question on it doesn't matter what. Um, or in terms of evaluating networks, you need to evaluate the quality of the networks, um, not necessarily what the network does. Do you think that uh, online spaces provide and develop uh, quality networks? Is is that um, some sort of a boundary? And also, there was a question from um, Marriott, it looks like, um, about why does it matter what the quality of networking is over what it does? I didn't understand your first question, Jeff. Is there is there any correlation, do you think, between online uh, spaces as um, and quality of networks? You know, do uh, f do quality networks only happen face to face, or do you think that online is effective way? Um, I, okay, I I don't have any evidence to suggest that there is or there isn't a correlation. I I sat in a meeting in Ecuador uh, about three or four weeks ago. There were three networks. Two of those networks um, had no website no online space to, to, to talk of. They were um, grassroots NGOs from a province in uh, Ecuador and they worked together really well and when asked could you survive without any funding they said yes we do right now. And the third network was an internationally driven network. It was uh, set up by a British based NGO to look at corporate social responsibility. It worked while the money was there and as soon as the money was gone nobody talked to each other again and they had a fantastic website and and lots of uh, nice tools to exist online um, but I do think that um, Simon can talk more about these issues than I can on the issue of, um, of evaluating I think my comment was that um, yes networks can I think networks can be assessed or evaluated to look at what they do um, in terms of influence or capacity building if that's what there's set up to do. But most networks that we, um, we work with originally set up to um, just be a network, just bring people together or facilitate engagement between people who have a common purpose, a common, a common uh, job, a common interest. Um, and so, so we should be paying attention to that as well and not forget that that, that has value um, in itself. My suggestion has been for a while that if uh, donors want to fund the networks and help set them up so that these networks can be vehicles to influence or to train or to develop something else, they should first take their time to see the network flourish and evolve and, and function as a network. So where, where relationships are the ones we would expect of a network, um, some of them won't work. Some of them, the members won't want to engage. They will find it difficult. They'll have uh, conflicting interests, and they will they will not survive. But the ones that do, the ones that are strong enough, they can then be given extra functions. They can then be given extra roles to take, and and those are the ones that might then be evaluated in the future, or whether they influence policy or train others or develop capacity, etc. Whatever. Great, uh, Simon. Would you like to come in? Yeah, I was just going to follow up on the the, the question about um, online networks, and and I, I think um, I probably wouldn't um, pay much sort of attention to you know whether the network is online or offline. I think the the network functions approach is applicable to um, to any network, regardless of how it chooses to interact. Um, I think if a network primarily interacts using online tools, then you can call it an online network, that's fine. Um, I think there's lots of networks who, um, who, who would interact more through face-to-face -face communication. Um, there may even be some that exist these days that uh, interact through post, I don't know. Um, yeah, Kike is just telling me he's met one. Um, so I, I think the means of, of interaction 
is um, is is less important than um, the the functions that it's trying to achieve. Rick, oh, I have to unmute you. Sorry, there we go, Rick. Yeah. Um, I think uh, just one comment I wanted to make. I, it, what often strikes me is when I'm looking at the interchange between people on the email list that I moderate is that I'm looking at the tip of a very big iceberg, or a, a, certainly a big iceberg. I'm seeing a public exchange between members of the email list, but outside that public exchange, I am fairly confident there's, there is at least as much one-to-one -one private exchange uh, between people who have initially started a discussion on the email list. Uh, sometimes because I encourage them to do that uh, because of the specialist nature of the inquiry, but other times just simply because that's the way prefer, people prefer to do it. So, you know, um, so my view of what's going on is very partial. I think the other metaphor I would probably use is of an archipelago that a given email list is like one island in an archipelago and occasionally boats arrive from other islands bringing news which have been shared across multiple islands. These are when people apologize for cross postings about some upcoming event. And uh, when these boats arrive, when these messages arrive, we do hear about the existence of these other islands, uh, but generally we've got a very limited view of how the members of our network are connected to other networks. Uh, I've done some inquiry in the past getting participants in the email list to fill in emails, fill in an online survey saying what other email lists they belong to. And uh, it's the sort of thing which I think would be more interesting to do uh, more often in the future. But it's this notion, I think that the abiding impression I have is a very, one has a partial understanding of what's going on, or, or even of the network that one is facilitating. Thanks, Rick. Um, there are still lots of questions out there, and I appreciate the participation from everyone. Um, looking at the time, however, I think that we need to move on to kind of close, closing thoughts from each of our panelists and discussants. Um, I'm going to say maybe you have two minutes each to provide any closing thoughts, and as you're doing so, one of the questions that uh, we had in um, from uh, ben Adam in New York City was, can the presenters give specific examples of networks that they're talking about so we can situate the term network in their presentations? Um, so what I'll ask is uh, maybe instead of that question, uh, to give an example of networks uh, as part of your closing comments, maybe what is your favorite network and you can't say the one that you facilitate. So let's go ahead and take this in terms, uh, uh, Ben, Kike, Nancy, Rick, then Simon to close it out. So two minutes each, Ben, I'm passing it over to you. Yeah, um, my favorite network is actually represented amongst the uh, participants here. ADRRN is, is one of my favorite networks. And the reason why I like ADRRN is unlike many of the other networks that we're talking about, it's, it emerged from a group of southern civil society organizations who came together, identified a need for networking around in a regional context, in this case in Asia around disaster risk reduction and humanitarian response and found ways of networking together in the midst of disaster, after disaster, in order to facilitate learning, bound together by their social interactions and their professional connections to each other, and so sometimes just doing remarkable things, you know, people from one ADRRN member going in to help um, in, in Pakistan after the earthquake, for example, going in and volunteering with another ADR and member and putting two or three weeks of their time into helping out with a disaster response in a, in a different Asian country or someone else going from Bangladesh to Sri Lanka to talk to them about flood prevention and flood risk management again on a voluntary basis and to me that's my favorite network because the incentives are, are simply to my, in my mind and I, I'm sure Mihir will have his own views on this but the incentives are, it seems so, so profoundly to be driven by the humanitarian principle that we should all be helping wherever we can and the network is there as a, as a vehicle for us to do that and I, I found it a tremendously inspiring experience working with them. And, and I guess um, maybe that relates quite usefully to my, my closing thoughts that ne networks happen where, the, where there's energy and where there's enthusiasm for it. You can't, you can't manage a network into existence but once a network is there you can use tools and techniques to better understand it and to make the most of it for all of the members involved and 
I'd like to think we've been exploring some of these areas a little bit more today. I think there's much more work for us to do. And I think the key is to put put those people who are finding ways of networking together at the heart of this dialogue and asking them how can we how can we collectively make this easier, better, more effective, more strategic, more focused on the needs of the people that you're trying to serve. Thank you, Ben. Um, Kike? Um, hi. Um, as usual, when asked a question like this, I forget the names of networks. So I'll say my, my favorite network is my school network because it gets me, uh, gets me jobs, it gets me uh, friends in cities um, that I've just moved in, and it, um, it, um, it's just very handy. Um, but more seriously, um, although that was a serious comment, my um, uh, the two networks I, I I know a little bit more, and therefore I I guess I like is uh, I'll come up and learn a community that I don't facilitate, um, that's facilitated by uh, by Simon, um, and um, and Alnup that uh, I don't have any, anything to do with, but is facilitated or was facilitated or driven in many ways by uh, by Ben. Um, and I think I think they have unique uh, features, uh, both of them. Um, and I think the reason why I like the outcome of learning community is because um, it is pretty much driven by its members, as Rick was saying, by a core group of members at the top of the iceberg. And there is a there is a constantly growing community of um, of uh, uh, people who are interested and just uh, listen and, and participate uh, when they have the time and when they want. Um, but I, I do have a feeling that if uh, if funding disappeared for that community, um, there was it would still work. Things would still happen, and I think that's a good uh, test. My key message is it's basically, and it's, this is focused at the kind of networks that I I have been working with, which are the consortiums like the one that uh, you Jeff work work for, um, which are uh, large alliances or large groups. Um, so large consortium of organizations or people coming together for a for a program, if you want. And uh, my key message is that when thinking about setting up a network to deliver uh, a service, to deliver a product, uh, we need to stop and think if this is the best way of doing this, uh, because there might be other organizational um, uh, structures that might work um, as well or even better. There's nothing wrong with a subcontract. Um, there's nothing wrong with hiring somebody to do a job if that's the most efficient way to do it and if that's what it needs to be done. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, Nancy, let's go over to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought Simon was going to go next. You caught me by surprise. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that the network that has most significance to me, there's two, and I, I have to admit, I, I always end up getting involved in facilitation, which is both a plus and a minus, so I'll confess that I participate and facilitate in both these networks. One is CAM for Dev Knowledge Management for Development, which for me has been the way that I found the people who invited me here today, which is how I connected with many of the people who are in this call or in the chat room, and your significant teachers to me. And that's why it's important. And I find it very interesting at this very moment that I am talking about the power of KM for Dev as a network, is we're struggling with our own identity as we've grown and, as, and trying to figure out how we sustain ourselves both through resources and practices. And so, it points to the, the very important underlying um, issue of these more open and flexible networks, which is, and it goes back to I think a comment Rick made earlier, it's, things are changing, they're emergent, and we have to often negotiate and renegotiate the target. The target changes, and part of the life of these networks is just enough conversation about agreement about what we're doing but not so much that it distracts us from doing it. And, and for me, that tension is something that I want to learn more about and d I dance with every single day. The other community is The Well, which is one of the early online communities. And I got there via another online community, but it's a place 
for safe conversations with people who think in many different ways. And it's a closed community, and it exhibits very different things, and there's something for me to learn from a closed network as well as an open network. And to really understand for me, and the question I think I bring to the ongoing research agenda is, how do we understand boundaries and boundedness? And this idea of boundary management from outcome mapping, of facilitating boundaries. Um, because for me, it's not so much a question as whether we should or shouldn't use a network. I think we are enmeshed and engaged in networks, whether we like it or not. But maybe how we work the boundaries, how we understand them. So the practice of network mapping, but also the practice of just stopping and describing what kind of network we're talking about, is to be a little more deliberate in our language. Because I think we have tons to learn from each other, but if we can't have just enough shared language, we don't have to be lockstep. I think we're going to lose a lot of that learning. Thanks, Nancy. Rick, over to you. Um, favorite networks. I think one is called Remap, uh, which was a network of people working in monitoring and evaluation roles of, in UK NGOs, uh, mainly in London, from about 1992 up until about 2006 or 2007. They met about three times a year in London, face-to-face. Um, -face. Uh, nobody ever funded the network. Uh, it was all self-organized uh, on a basis of who was, ever was interested in, in making presentations. And it sort of came to an end a couple of years ago, but I think you know, um, you know 15, 16, 17 years, 15 years or so of um, self-organized uh, activities was pretty impressive. And I really enjoyed the face-to-face -face contact with people, even though we had a backup email list to, to facilitate the organization of meetings. Um, so I really appreciated that. Um, another network was, is Pelican, which I think still exists. Um, but which was very ably uh, facilitated for a while um, by a person who, um, whose name I, I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember at the moment, but um, he was very good in terms of posing a question which would then initiate a discussion and then he would document that discussion and feed it back to everyone. And I felt that um, extracted uh, a lot more value from what tend to be otherwise very sort of episodic and short interactions between people in email lists. It, it, it led to a deeper and uh, more intensive discussion than otherwise. In terms of where to go in the future, I think I support Nancy's view of being uh, paying attention to language and being a bit clearer uh, about that without necessarily having a sort of hegemony on any particular interpretation. And I myself think the way to go, uh, one way to help us go forward in that direction is to pay more attention to the tools available through social network analysis, uh, which is a very multidisciplinary field. Um, there are lots of, uh, uh, there's lots of literature and software available on this, but also there is this wide open opportunity that I've mentioned of developing more participatory and empowering approaches to social network analysis, which I think for people coming from a development background um, is, is an, an opportunity and also an obligation. That's it. Great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, and Simon, closing thoughts. Thanks, Jeff. Um, favorite network? Um, well, a, a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to, um, to, to study a network using the network functions approach. And um, the, the network is called the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, um, I-N-E-E. -E. I mean, we thought they were uh, a really nice network. I mean, it, it is a network of uh, agencies, of um, half UN agencies, half um, sort of international NGOs involved in, um, in, in sort of emergency work. Um, so this actually responds to a, a question that I just saw on the, um, on the chat about this, um, you know, the difference between networks of organizations and networks of, of people. And, INEE, I think, um, had this balance really nicely because it it was a, a network of organizations, but it, the way the network manifests was always just through relationships between people. There was always key people within those agencies who played uh, representatives, um, who, and, and actually the network formed um, through the interaction between about six or seven people. Um, 
across these different agencies, and they just, um, in their interactions together, they recognise the importance of um, networking around the issue of education and emergencies, and wanted to develop this quite a fledgling field, probably about um, 10 or 15 years ago now, into um, something that was a bit more substantial, a bit more professional, and they realised that they could only do that through a network, and not just a network of of those people, but a network of the organisations that they're part of. And so I think that that story really illustrates the you know the the, the power and the and the interaction between organisations and people. Um, but also I liked the fact that it was uh, multi-funded, so there was no there was no real centre for um, of funding, and therefore no um, dominant sort of control uh, center for the network. There was lots of agencies putting in money in lots of different places. It was more about funding projects and funding initiatives that are um, coordinated by the network and, and um, involve people from different agencies within the network. Um, and so that, uh, I thought actually that was a um, part of the form that really suited the, the functions of the network. Um, as a takeaway, final takeaway comment from me, um, well, I, mean, I would just echo our last paragraph in the paper, actually. If, if there's one thing that we would ask of those people who are setting up networks, it's to recognize that, um, as Nancy said, that networks are a part of humanity. They exist out there already. You know, we, we can't create them or destroy them, all we can do is, um, is, is uh, try to make use of them and, and um, put, you know, put them to good use. So the main thing is just to, to recognize and to identify those networks that already exist and build those by applying resources strategically. Um, and if, you know, if, if if the kind of networks that we're looking for don't already exist, then we have to ask ourselves, why is that? You know, what's preventing networks from forming? Because it could um, take too much resources to actually stimulate a network that, that doesn't exist already, and it could be more effective to, um, to find some other mechanism for delivering that particular uh, initiative. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Simon, and to all of the uh, presenters and the discussants for, I think, a really fascinating uh, look at networks, communities, defining boundaries, uh, leaving boundaries free as we're going. Um, to, to answer my own question, I suppose uh, I'm going to have to e echo Kike in terms of my favorite network might actually be my uh, group of Facebook friends and the ability to find answers to the most, um, what I would imagine um, esoteric questions uh, at the drop of an iceberg, I think, uh, or the drop of a hat, I suppose, is very useful. In terms of formal networks, um, I have to say one of the most useful to me right now has actually been the EBPDN, Evidence-Based Policy and Development Network, um, who whenever I have, again, one of those esoteric questions like finding policy briefs in Tajik, uh, delivers every time. So um, it's a uh, very useful in that way, and I think that that's an interesting uh, part about networks. When we have um, kind of those specific questions and queries that Google is never going to turn up a uh, good policy brief in uh, in Tajik, but uh, people are, and I think that that's another um, really valuable element that uh, we need to. Uh, bears discussion further, and I, I think that there are lots of questions around that I've seen um, that remain unanswered, and I hope that we can continue on this conversation uh, in various formats. I know that Simon will be sending around a link to the recording of this uh, webinar, in addition to the various um, uh, presentations that were given. Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that link to the chat room will stay live if people want to refer back to it. Um, I think I also saw uh, both Kike and Nancy offering to repost uh, some of the comments on their various uh, websites. 
uh, which I'm sure are being shared right now in the chat room. Yeah. Um, perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for following. Um, I don't know, Simon, is there any other closing business that needs to be taken care of? No, I think you've taken care of it, Jeff. It's great. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much to everybody who submitted questions, to everybody who's hung in, in there uh, until the end of this uh, two-hour webinar. And again, thank you to the presenters and to the panelists. It's been a real pleasure.